So welcome everyone, uh, my name is uh, Chris Yue, I'm an honorary research professor in history, which is a fancy way of saying I'm retired, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to welcome you all here today uh, to listen to two people, briefly our local communist candidate Sean Burton, who's uh, up against, uh, I would say, just Jack Harris really, in, uh, in St. John's East and uh, the leader of the Communist Party who came down from Toronto via Halifax uh, a couple days ago, Miguel Figueroa. Uh, he's been a leader for quite some time. Uh, I think the last time he was in this room, he was voted the most popular leader of all the political leaders in Canada uh, by MTV. So, uh, so clearly we're going for the youth vote. And, uh, <laughs> So Sean, uh, our candidate, uh, was uh, is a Cornerbrook-born man. He uh, he taught in Korea, that's South Korea, not North Korea. And uh, and his wife is here today, Susie, and she is uh, the uh, maker. She's a professional chef. So we have these special muffins. Uh, we have lots of uh, uh, material and. Uh, um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the History Society who agreed to put their name on the poster because as a, as a retired individual I'm not allowed to book rooms, so, uh, unless I pay for it. And uh, being a communist I don't like paying for things, so uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank especially Jennifer in the middle of the, uh, or second from the end there who helped do this. And we also have this young lady from NTV who's making sure the word gets out. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Anything else? Oh, we have a we have, we have somebody from uh, VOCM as well. Oh. A little more discreet. But yeah. Oh, VOCM. <laughs> okay. So we have uh, we have radio. So you got you got the. You can keep yourself phone on too. You you can tweet, Thank blog, <laughs> peapod, whatever you want to do. So uh, so I'm going to introduce first of all uh, Sean Burton just to talk for a few minutes. He's already been to a number of uh, of panels. I was talking to Jack Harris uh, after the one in Paradise uh, last week, uh, and Jack said it's great to have someone to the left of him. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, Sean Burton, followed immediately by Miguel Figueroa. Thanks. Uh, well, I'll just uh, I'll keep my remarks fairly short, and uh, thank you again, Chris, for uh, introducing us there. Uh, yeah, uh, where to begin? I guess I could talk a little bit about our party and uh, why we're deciding to run in St. John's East, um, and then Miguel will get into the, the, the larger details of this election and uh, the condition Canada is in right now, and I guess the condition of uh, the world today and our position in it. Um, so where to begin? Um, well, as Chris said, I am from Cornerbrook, I've uh, been in St. John's now for over a year, uh, but I've been around the world. As you said, I lived in Korea, and uh, earlier this year I had the opportunity to work and live in uh, the Arctic. I was in Pondinwit, Nunavut. Uh, very eye-opening experience. I encourage anyone to, to get up there and, and witness the North for themselves and see what's going on up there. Um, I've been a member of the Communist Party for about 15 years. Uh, this is my first involvement in open politics, uh, participating in an election. Uh, I'm very happy to be doing this and presenting a unique alternative to the people of St. John's East uh, and more generally to the entire province of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, because quite frankly the other parties aren't talking uh, about the kind of things that we are or if they do mention some similarities uh, they're not as extensive as we would like them to be. So we have a very wide-reaching platform uh, it is very ambitious, but it's also a very realistic one. It's, it's well within the power of this country, which is extremely wealthy, to accomplish what we want to accomplish in our platform if the wealth of the country was more equitably distributed. 
Um, so that's basically what we're fighting for. I mean, we realize that we are a small party, uh, and we're not running in every riding, so it wouldn't be possible for us to form a government at this time. Um, but at the very least, by participating in these elections, we're presenting a different set of ideas, an alternative set of ideas, and it is, uh, I guess, changing the political discussion in this, in this province uh, and in the country in general. And that's a very valuable contribution to the democratic process in this country, and of course we want to encourage a larger movement of people to fundamentally shift the way things are done in Canada. So I guess on that note, I will turn things over to Miguel, and uh, yeah, I'm sure he'll keep us riveted. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be back here in the, uh, on the Rock, St. John's, and uh, at a memorial. Um, um, many moons ago, too many uh, care to reflect upon in detail, but uh, many years ago, uh, I was a student organizer in um, what was then called the National Union of Students, and then changed its name to the Canadian Federation of Students. Um, and I was a, the Atlantic field worker working out of Halifax, and I came up uh, to uh, both the memorial and to the campus at Cornerbrook a number of times, uh, way back in the 70s. Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with it, but it's been several years since I've been back at St. John's, so I'm very pleased to be back here. Um, it's a very short visit, as uh, Sean mentioned, uh, because we are running a small number of candidates, a modest number of candidates, about 26 or, or so candidates across the country, but in virtually every province and, and, and virtually all of the major cities particularly. We're running in some rural ridings as well, but and a lot of the urban centers, I think, with the exception maybe of Regina, where we don't have a candidate, we're running in Winnipeg and Edmonton, Calgary, West Coast, certainly in, 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 in many parts of Ontario, London, Guelph, you know, St. Catharines, Toronto, of course, Sudbury, we're running up in Sudbury, and of course in Ottawa as well, and in Quebec. Uh, and we have a candidate uh, here in Newfoundland for the first time in decades, so this is rather important for us, and it's a it's a small re-entry, and it's a long overdue re-entry uh, into uh, into politics uh, here in this province, part of the federal election campaign. But we're very pleased about it. Um, our party is not uh, an electoralist party in a traditional sense. Um, you know, we we have a different view of politics. We think that politics is not something that happens, you know for five minutes every four or five years when you walk into a polling station and you can be cast a ballot. We think that politics uh, is all around us. It touches every aspect of our life, whether we're trying to get public transit or pay for our education or find a job or worrying about what's going to happen to us uh, down the road when we, uh, when we retire and so on. Um, and we think that <coughs> uh, political activism and political struggle takes place not only during election campaigns, but um, on an ongoing basis in our communities, on the streets in the form of demonstrations and mass actions, uh, and, and also in the workplaces, workers fighting for their rights and, and so on against <coughs> corporations are always interested in increasing the intensification of labor and the exploitation of labor so they can make bigger profits. I mean, that's what, when you cut through it all, that's what capitalism is all about. Uh, and that's why, in fact, uh, it's not by accident that we see the social disparities in this country and, in fact, right around the world widening so that the 1% are becoming less and less of a 1%, maybe a half percent or <laughs> 10, you know, the, the concentration of wealth is uh, accelerating at an exponential uh, rate. Um, and uh, poverty and misery and uh, uh, mass unemployment and so on um, well, those conditions are uh, also uh, accelerating. Um, uh, Oxfam, in fact, I think uh, Oxfam International did a, did a uh, released a study earlier this year that indicated that uh, that just in the period from 2007 or 2008, just before the onset of the global meltdown, the global economic crisis that hit in 2008. To last year, that's only a period of seven, six or seven years, 
that the concentration of wealth in the world had gone from the top 1% in 2007 having 44% uh, of all the wealth in, in the world, 1% having almost half of the world's pie of, of wealth and income. And in only seven years, that, that went up to 1% owning 48%. So it went from 44 to 48%, which is a massive increase, really, if you think about it, in only seven years. Um, and that trajectory, of course, is, is continuing. Uh, and people are conscious of it. It is not an abstract or an academic thing for the vast majority of working people. We know even in this country, uh, people um, are struggling as never before to uh, um, to put food on the table, to cover their mortgage payments, to pay for their children's education, because the cost of post-secondary education has also gone through the roof. It's a little bit better here in Newfoundland than it is elsewhere, but in general, it has been, you know, escalating at an, at an alarming rate. Um, or to, to pay for dental bills and so on and so forth. Um, and in fact, um, <clears throat> recently it was announced that um, a sociological study had been done in Toronto, in Greater Toronto, which is, you know, historically, you know, Toronto, Toronto, that's, a, you know, that's a, the center of the universe, right? That's where, where all the wealth <coughs> and, and uh, <coughs> employment is located. But actually, in, in the Greater Toronto area, up to 40% of people um, are virtually one paycheck away from financial distress. They lose one paycheck and all of a sudden they're having trouble meeting their car payments or their mortgage payments and so on. So forget about personal savings. In fact, the rate of household savings in this country is the lowest it has ever been since the economists started recording such statistics. And conversely, or it's more of a corollary, the rate of household debt that people are indebted to, the mortgages, the car payments, uh, the credit cards, and a surprisingly large number of people are actually living on their credit cards. And it's not because they're booking flights to Bahamas or something like that. They're, they're using their credit cards to meet their, their weekly bills and going deeper and deeper. That that rate of household debt has never been higher uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the history, at least the recorded history of that, that kind of economic statistic. Um, and the cost of housing in particular has skyrocketed in many parts of the country. You know, we hear about, well, the housing market in Toronto or the housing market in Vancouver being ridiculously um, inflated and out of control. Um, but uh, in fact, in many urban centers around the, uh, around the country, housing costs have, have increased and people are spending 30, 40, up to 50% or more of their net income just paying the rent or just paying the mortgage, uh, the mortgage or housing related costs. So this is a very real thing for people, and people are looking for alternatives. And that's one of the main reasons why we see in this particular uh, election, after almost 10 years of Harper and conservative rule across the country, um, which has been a disaster for working people. It's been a, a catastrophe for, um, for Aboriginal peoples, for women, for youth and students. Um, in fact, for most uh, people who um, are either, uh, well, if they're employed, their conditions have been undermined and their pensions and their benefits have been rolled back. If they're partially employed, which an increasing number of people are, caught in part-time jobs, low-wage uh, jobs, temporary jobs, contract employment, uh, and other forms of precarious um, work, um, their conditions have deteriorated. And then, of course, we have the unemployed themselves. So we have underemployed in the millions and also uh, a very large number of unemployed, far more than Statistics Canada lets on because their figures are based just on participation rate. But if you look at the fact that an increasing number of people aren't even in the labor market technically anymore because there's no jobs out there for them to get, um, and they're, they're living on, on, uh, on really meager uh, fixed incomes. 
Uh, in the United States, it's even worse. The particip participation rate in the U.S. economy, people say, that, oh, there's a recovery in the U.S. economy. But that belies the fact that 38% of employable people in the United States are no longer even in the labor market. They've just given up and trying to find work. And so because of all of that, you know, there are more and more Canadians who say enough is enough. We need to uh, uh, get rid of this government. And uh, the anti-Harper movement, or the Stop Harper movement, is very um, strong and growing across the country. More than, uh, you know, I would say not just two-thirds, but, but more like 80% uh, uh, of Canadians, including those who aren't even going to bother to vote because they're so cynical about the electoral process. I figure that elections don't make a difference, and it doesn't matter how I vote, we end up with the same old, same old. Um, uh, and, and a lot of people are very jaded about the electoral process, and with, with some reason, by the way. But of those who are going to vote, or haven't even given up on voting, but nevertheless um, uh, are opposed to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the political line of the Harper government, it is a staggeringly high uh, percentage. And yet here we are less than two weeks from an election and it's still a question about whether or not uh, the Conservatives uh, will be defeated. Uh, people are weighing that up and how they should vote and how they should uh, uh, do wh what they can to uh, stop Parker. Um, if you're concerned about climate change uh, and uh, the really desperate situation that is uh, not only is developing or will develop, has already developed. Uh, and the impact of climate change is already being felt. But in order for us to seriously address the question of reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, of cutting our carbon footprint and so on, this calls for not only urgent measures, but radical measures to transform, to transition our economy uh, towards a greener economy. Um, if we're concerned about uh, issues relating to democracy, uh, you know, many of you around this table are no doubt very familiar with the fight against uh, Bill C-51 that was introduced by the, the Harper government to strengthen the intelligence uh, forces, their ability to penetrate and to spy on ordinary Canadians, to actually uh, act as agents provocateurs, to go into organizations, whether they're um, Aboriginal groups or environmental organizations or trade unions, and not to mention political parties, uh, to, uh, to try to discredit these movements, to divide them, to neutralize them, and so on. Um, and just to spy on our emails and all of our personal lives, uh, and to build up a reservoir of data uh, on ordinary Canadians, it makes what the RCMP used to do back in the 70s when they had a royal commission, the McDonald Commission, into RCMP wrongdoings, and they found out that the RCMP had secret files on three quarters of a million Canadians at the time, and that this was outrageous, and that's why the RCMP was removed and they, they established CSIS. Well, th the fact of the matter is, is that that didn't solve the problem. It, you know, it changed <laughs> the labels, of the, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, individual rights, uh, our rights to uh, um, uh, privacy and so on, uh, not to mention the right to dissent, to uh, publicly campaign peacefully, but nevertheless to, to publicly campaign against uh, uh, prevailing government policies, all of these rights are under increasing uh, threat and, and attack. Um, so if you're concerned about the issue of democracy or the environment, if you're concerned about the questions of war and peace, and Canada's increasing involvement in military adventures and aggression internationally, um, the growth of the military budget, which is now over $20 billion a year, that's an incredible amount of resources that is going into the military, mostly connected with our membership in NATO. And so if you start wondering, why are we still in NATO? I mean, let's remember that NATO was founded as a counterbalance to the big bad Soviet Union, you know, to the evil empire. Well, it's been 25 years since the Soviet Union imploded and so on. 
and yet NATO has continued to grow, the budgets have continued to grow, and NATO interventions and aggressions have spread long, you know, far beyond its original reach as a North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, and Canada's involvement in NATO as a result of that has driven up our military budgets as well and procurement budgets and, and what have you. And so you have this growing disparity, you have uh, our welfare system, our health care system, uh, our public education system under increasing stress and facing cutbacks and rollbacks and, and so on. Um, the, the real incomes of, of people, when it's <coughs> adjusted to inflation and adjusted uh, to, uh, um, to the cost of living and so on and so forth, that the real incomes of the vast majority of Canadians have actually gone down consecutively over the last 20 years. And yet, of course, the profits of the largest corporations, of the big banks, have just exploded. They've gone through the roof. So if you're concerned about all of these things, you're looking for alternatives. And here's the, here's the, excuse me, the dilemma. As people look around and say, well, if not the Tories, then what? Um, they look at the, the Liberals, the NDP, even the Greens. Essentially, and don't get me wrong, there are differences between these parties, for sure. The Tories are the preferred party of monopoly capital in this country, you know, of Bay Street, of the most powerful elites in this country. That's their party, and they bankroll them to the hilt, and that's why the Tories have so much money. It's not because moms and pops around the country are sending checks for $50 or $20 to, to Harper. It's because they have the you know, overwhelming support of big business in this country. Um, but the Liberals are also a big business party. If you know anything about Canadian history, you know that both the Liberals and the Tories, just kind of like, when people get fed up with the Tories, there was the Liberals that they could put in. And then, you know, and then when people get fed up with the Liberals, they go back to the Tories, bounce back, like a shell game, you know. But you always get the same thing at the end, right? Um, the NDP, historically, um, was the Social Democratic Party. And of course, um, we had, because um, uh, we're a very old party, we've been around for almost 100 years, I think 90, 96 years, 95 years. Um, we were founded in 1921, so I'm 94 years. 1921 in Guelph. And um, um, we, of course, ever since our founding, advocated for socialism. We don't believe in pooches or conspiracies. We know that socialism can only come when the people themselves, in their majority, decide, yes, we've got to do something else. This, this, this system of capitalism just isn't working any longer. But nevertheless, we've ad advocated for that ever since the beginning. And the NDP, when it was still CCF back in the 30s, when it was, when it was organized, also advocated for socialism. But their view was, well, socialism by degrees. We'll make a bunch of minor changes and reforms, and then somehow we'll wake up one morning over our breakfast coffee and our newspaper, and we'll say, geez, you know, we live in a socialist society. You know, I didn't even notice it happening. It happened so gradually. And that wasn't our view as communists. We uh, thought then, and we think now, that real social change happens not only through minor uh, reforms, but also revolutionary leaps, you know, and if you, you look at uh, um, what happened to the aristocracy, I mean, you know, there were big revolutions that took place, the French Revolution, and in England it was a little bit different, the American Revolution was really a revolt against uh, the aristocracy and the rising of, of uh, capitalist order, um, struggles against old slave societies between the slaves and the slave owners also had big class struggles, you know, you remember people like Spartacus and other slave revolts. So, uh, in our view, change happens quantitatively, but it also sometimes happens qualitatively. And that was the big debate we had with the NDP and with people who supported the NDP. They had this gradualist view of social change, and we had a revolutionary perspective with respect to getting to socialism. But we both believed in socialism. But that isn't the case anymore. The NDP has long since abandon even socialism as a goal. 
And recently, they actually re removed it from the Constitution uh, at their convention in, was it 2013 or, or so? Um, and if you look at the platform that the NDP is proposing in this election, it is really uh, center-right. It's not, you know, it has actually moved so far to the right that the Liberals, Justin Trudeau, and the Greens have actually outflanked the NDP on the left. And it's not because the Greens or the Liberals have moved to the left. It's because the NDP's moved so bloody far to the right to pose as a really non-threatening alternative. And the fact that, that a big business would not be so upset if Mulcair gets in. Well, they'd certainly be upset if we got in. <laughs> And, you know, they would be absolutely right, because we would definitely challenge and try to curb the power of, of the monopolies and in favor of, of working people, in favor of the vast majority. The problem, however, is that because there is no real, clear, and well-defined alternative to the policies of the Tories, the neoliberal or neoconservative, economic, social, foreign policy of the, of the Tories. That a lot of people are saying, well, geez, we really want to get rid of Harper, but not really that enthusiastic about the other choices. Now, I don't want to talk about Jack Harris. I, I've, I've met Jack Harris uh, over the years uh, when I was a reporter out here um, and, um, uh, and so on. You know, he, he seems like a pretty decent guy. And there are decent candidates running for all of these parties. Uh, candidates that have more progressive views, but the hierarchy of these parties have, in every case, virtually shifted um, uh, towards the, the right. And so they offer different plans, but all of these plans are all within a very small box of, of options, of choices. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're running, because we think that even though we're a small party, we have no resources, in the main we get very little coverage from the mass media. We do get some, like today. But generally speaking, it has been difficult for us to, to get exposure uh, in, the, uh, in, in the mainstream media, because we're considered, like a lot of the other small parties, as also rands. We're, you know, we're there, but we're not really that's serious. But if you look at the platform of our party, whatever you might think about it, you might disagree with parts of it, or you might disagree with all of it, but you will have to concede that it's a serious, well thought out, and comprehensive platform, which addresses everything from uh, issues about uh, rights of municipalities, uh, the rights of women, the LGBTQ uh, community, um, uh, the rights of Aboriginal peoples in this country. Um, um, social policy, economic, foreign policy, and so on. But we don't get um, very much exposure nationally. And uh, in some cases, we even, uh, we even get blocked out of all candidates' meetings. We have to fight our way into all candidates' meetings. They're called all, all candidates' meetings, but they don't invite all the candidates. Uh, it's kind of an odd situation. I don't know to what extent that's been the case here. I know that you participated in some, but in some parts of the country, um, we have been barred from all candidates' debates, even our registered candidates. And in one case of Victoria, just a few days ago, the organizers actually called the police on us and, and had us forcefully removed because we were saying, well, you know, this isn't, this isn't fair. I mean, this is not democratic. Uh, it, it is, in fact, the right of citizens to cast a vote. That's uh, Article 3, I think, of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the courts have determined that the right to vote means the right to cast an informed ballot. And you can't be informed and exercise your democratic franchise if some of the choices that are on that ballot have been hidden from you. Well, the argument is, well, you're not hidden completely. You can go and put up posters, lawn signs, and leaflets, and we do do that. <coughs> But, of course, it's very difficult, and we don't have corporate money, we don't have government money, we don't have union money. Uh, so it's a real uphill battle, and we know that we're a small voice.